Okay, one more moment. It's doing the three, two, one. Yeah. Oh, it, Marzi says we're, no? Yeah. Wait, webinar's now streaming live on Facebook. It says we're live. Hello, hello. Welcome. It's Tuesday, 4 o'clock Pacific, 7 o'clock Eastern, 1 a.m. here in Italy, and it's Facebook Live. And we have a very special guest today. Dr. Marissa Snyder is with us, and we're going to talk about hormones and how to reset your hormones. So let me see if anybody's out there. I'm looking at my phone. Oh yeah, Rosemary's there. Hello, Rosemary. And uh, great, glad to see that. Uh, give me some thumbs up, guys, as you're coming on board here so I know that you're here, which is always great. But it's nice to be able to start. Oh, Grace in Argentina. Hi, Grace, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, it's nice to start on time. It's really a great break when, we, when there's no technology problems and we can start on time. Yay! So Dr. Marissa, welcome and glad you're here with us today. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here and it's, it's a double dose of you today, so even better. Um, really excited about our interview. <laughs> yes, yes. We did an interview on Dr. Marissa's Facebook Live a couple of hours ago. And uh, so this is a, uh, a tag team match today. Uh, Claudine says hormones, love hearing about hormones. And yes, yes. And Lori's here from Georgia. And Jocelyn's here from California. Sandra from High Springs, Florida. And Brian from Leduc, Alberta. Uh, that's great. Great. Thank you. It's all, you know, what's great is the um, international flavor of what we've got here. And uh, it's always great to see. So thank you, everyone, for joining. And um, as we start this off, this topic of hormones, uh, there are many, many reasons why hormones are uh, critically important to keep into balance. And that's what we're gonna learn more about from Dr. Marissa. I just wanna comment on one of them, that uh, there are uh, five different pathways in the development of Alzheimer's that have been identified, five categories, if you will, many contributors, many pathways, but five categories. <laughs> And one of them is hormones. So when your hormones are out of balance, your brain doesn't function right. And that may contribute to the inflammation in your brain that manifests eventually as enough brain damage and you've got Alzheimer's. So Sharon's here from Australia where, let me see if I've got this right. Sharon, is it 8.30 on Wednesday morning in Australia, if I'm remembering correctly, the time gap, which is, uh, uh, so unusual to have that extra half hour. I love that you know the time gap from Italy, not necessarily yeah. from the States. That yes. is great. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, usually Marzi and I take a nap uh, somewhere around 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the evening here and then wake up after an hour or two to, because um, uh, we're here in Italy and we live here in Italy now. Yes. So, uh, we've we done this. There. Say it again. I was just, we were just in Italy for a month. Oh, how marvelous. Yeah, oh, my, my cousin there. Carol's, my, my cousin oh, Carol is watching from uh, Pittsburgh. Hi, Carol. Hey, Hi. Carol. Maryland's in Newfoundland, Canada. Karen's here from Maine. Uh, Lori says hi from the land of the Packers in Green Bay. Hi, Lori. <laughs> Lynn's in Miami. So it's great. You know, we're, we're up and running. So Dr. Marissa, my first question would be, why did you find your passion in dialing down about balancing hormones? Such a great question, Dr. Tom. And you know, about 10 years ago, I was having a lot of issues. I called it, at the time, I didn't really know exactly what was going on with me. I had horrible chronic fatigue and I was, it was in the midst of hormone chaos. A lot of things played a role. A big part of it was that I just burned myself into the ground. Um, and I was living this big lie back then where I thought, as long as I wasn't crawling on the floor, I was managing stress. And eventually I found myself on the floor. So I went, <laughs> that's what happened. I was like, well, I did it. I'm now crawling on the floor. And I remember vividly waking up one of the days that I was heading off to the office, go see patients. And it literally felt like there was this invisible hand pressing me back 
into the bed. I, 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 it took everything out of me to get out of, out of the bed that day, to get into the bathroom, to, you know, to do the necessities, shower, all of that. So that I could go and see patients. And it was, I felt a lot of shame, a lot of guilt because here I am. I had a lot of women in my practice. They were dealing with a lot of the same issues that I was dealing with. And here I was, I hadn't really figured out how to get myself well yet. And I remember going to a doctor because I, it wasn't very clear. I just had a lot of different symptoms. I remember I got my labs done and what was given to me was the pill um, and, uh, and, and, and anxiety medication. Those were the two options for me. And I remember looking down at these scripts when I was, I was 29 years old and I thought to myself, like, this is not how we do, it's not how we get people well. This isn't how we do healthcare. And I was a biochemist before I became a practitioner for many years. And I knew that I could dig into the research. And so I had spent the last decade really just doing research and trying to discover a lot of what you do every single day, which is that root cause medicine. Like how do we get to the root cause of it? It's one thing for a doctor to just throw pills. And I can't imagine, you know what I, I learned then was that my story was not unique. I was many, many millions of women where we were coming into the offices and, and it's so easy to write scripts for, you know, for patients and to just send them on their way and to just kind of dismiss whatever's going on. And at that time, I was really fascinated. I was just about to write a book or just about to publish a book on antioxidants. And so food became a really big part of this journey for me. Um, and it's been a big part of the journey ever since. But I realized that with more, we needed more advocates for women's health and more advocates for understanding what's going on with our hormone systems, the why behind that. I know we talked a lot about that today, those two pathways, one, environmental toxins, and two, what we put at the end of our fork. And that was just not being discussed at all at any length um, with me back then. Got it, got it. And it's great that it, you found your passion there. Uh, let me say that Sharon Hardy says, I was pretty close. It's 9 a.m. in Australia. Now, I really don't understand that because uh, uh, there's been an extra half hour in the difference between wherever I am and Australia. So maybe, uh, Sharon, you have to let me know if there's different parts of Australia in terms of time zones that go by a half hour. Because uh, I thought I had it down, and I'm glad to, thanks, I'm glad to know I don't, but uh, I need to understand why. Well, you were saying you guys take a nap and then get up. Is there someone you guys talk to in Australia every day? Uh, when folks are on Facebook Live in Australia, they'll tell me what time it is. And, okay. it's, and so it, it must be there's a couple of half hour time zones in it. Australia. It must be that way. So Claudine's in Carlisle, uh, Kathleen's in Michigander, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Sandra's uh, in uh, County Cary. Hi, Sandra. There was one here I just saw that was pretty uh, cool. Let me find. Here's Judy in, in Melbourne. Uh, uh, Widyara Nadui, uh, sorry for butchering that, don't mean to, is from, hello. she says, hello from Malaysia. Manuela yeah. says, hello, Dr. Tom and team from Sydney, Australia. And someone just said, and I can't find it now, but they said they're vacationing in Bali. And well, thank you for watching while you're on vacation. And we'll certainly do our best to make this worthwhile for you. Yes, and entertaining. We're gonna entertain you yeah. today. <laughs> <laughs> Helen's, Helen's in London. Sue also is in Australia. It's a vast continent. It has many time zones. Thank you, Sue, for uh, telling me that. Okay, let's move on. And Montfarsi is saying, got it, got it. Get back to the topic on hand. Okay, honey. <laughs> All right. Thanks, so, Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, so one of the emphasis and the title that um, you had suggested for today is how hormones affect weight. Mm -hmm. So can, can we start there? What's the correlation between that stubborn weight that won't come off or won't come on and hormones? Well, as you know, just as well as I know, the interplay between our thyroid hormones and our, well, honestly, the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. I know a lot of people talk about the adrenal hormones and yes, they are the adrenal hormones, but what's really playing a role is what's going on right here. You know, stress plays such a big role in all of it. I talk a lot about perceived stress. I know for me, I lived in a world of perceived stress. I think a lot of people do where we're just, you know, it, there's always something coming. There's that project or the endless to-do list or um, whatever it may be. And I find, well, at least for me, and I, what I've looked at it with a lot of women, a lot of studies, 
is that when we are in a high late high state of sympathetic dominance that we that either not only do we deregulate our reproductive hormones and i i feel like before we even look at reproductive hormones like estrogen and progesterone and even testosterone we've got to look at the stress hormones we've got to look at the me metabolic hormones such as thyroid but they do an interplay it's as equally as stress can impact the way that our thyroid functions i know that thyroid has an impact on the way that our our stress or our stress hormones function but what I've seen a lot in women is that we tend to be pretty overly stressed. And we know that when cortisol levels have been deregulated, whether there's a lot of free cortisol in the system, or it's just, it's we're not taking it up enough or we're using too much of it, not only do we deregulate those, those reproductive hormones, but we do create a leaky gut. We know that stress creates leaky gut. We know that stress deregulates insulin. I mean, I think of cortisol as a way of helping to manage insulin regulation. And when it's out of control, we, we definitely not only have higher cravings, but we just don't manage it as well. We're not, we're not able to handle um, the regulation of insulin. And then thyroid comes into play. We've got that gas pedal where if your body is in constant state of perceived survival, well, that means we need more fuel. We need more energy. We need more expenditure. And I find that our thyroids, my thyroid levels can also take a major hit here. So what I see in women is when we have prolonged long-term stress over time, that we start to develop visceral belly fat, we start to see insulin get deregulated, we get crazy cravings, and we end up holding on to this stubborn fat. Now, mind you, this can also be happening in coinciding with toxic overload. So we have toxins coming in, we got stress coming in, and I feel like it's this big amalgam of just mess where we, we, we struggle with losing weight. And until we address the toxins and until we address the stress, I have a, a quote that I use a lot that says, you can't green smoothie your way out of chronic stress because I tried. I used to drink, I mean, I still do. I drink green smoothies all the time. I drink green juices, but I remember I could make a green smoothie in three to five minutes with my Vitamix, clean it up, run with my little heels, like, like a Tasmanian devil with lip gloss into the car and I could drink, I could gulp my green smoothie while driving 90 miles an hour on the freeway, trying to get to a meeting while I'm on a, a phone meeting with somebody. Like that was my, and I was, I was doing it because I was drinking my, I was fine because I was drinking that green smoothie. You know, like we, <laughs> so. I, love, I, I, uh, I, I love the visual of the Tasmanian devil in, in high heels racing to the car with a green smoothie to go tell people how to be healthy. Exactly, because I guess usually I was off about to go teach a, teach an event. I was gonna go speak on antioxidants or I was gonna go, and I thought right. that as long as I had the right fuel that I was gonna be okay. But I was constantly in this perceived state of stress. So it was no surprise when I started putting on weight, particularly abdominal belly fat, um, even though I was pretty much surviving on green smoothies most of the time. Got it, got it. So uh, for everyone out there, what she just said, yeah. is that hormones are like a baseball team. There's nine players on the team yes. at yeah. one time. And if there's anyone who's not playing, if they sit down and take their baseball glove and throw it down on the ground, they just sit there and that they're not doing their part, the team is not going to win. It's not likely to win, right? So there's, there's a symphony that has to be played amongst all of your hormones. And there are some that seem to have more of a direct effect on... Uh, weight than others, but they all have a role to play. And if I heard you correctly, you're associating our outlook on life and how we live life, the stress that we generate as a primary uh, pedal to the metal type of uh, accelerator for hormone imbalances. Yes. Definitely a big player. And one where, you know, you, and not to say that you can't, green smoothies help. There's no doubt about that. I'm not, it's, you know what, you could, you could be living that life and eating McDonald's, you know, and that would definitely not set you up for success. So I think food plays a major role, but I also, you know, for me, I was, I felt like the food became the number one thing that I started focusing on. But I still, I, it, was a, it was a slow progression for me, Dr. Tom. And I had realized that there was this underlying belief mechanism, this belief system that's not enough or it was that my worthiness was being challenged. And I just felt like I needed to constantly prove my worth. 
and I needed to work harder and be be better and and take care of everybody and do all the things. And it wasn't until I was able to let a lot of that go and and re I would always say like protect my energy. You know, and that's when the major shift happened for me. Yes, the detoxification piece had to happen. Yes, the food had to be there. But also that third component, which I know you talk a lot about, which is the mindset. I felt like the mindset was the one piece that I couldn't get right. I was following all the rules, but I wasn't changing the way that I thought about myself and how I operated inside my body. Yeah, yeah, very important. Thanks for that, that's, that's really clear. So on this Australian thing, I'm told uh, Manuela tells us it's 9 a.m. in Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane, uh, but the East Coast is 9 a.m., South Australia is 9 a.m., Western Australia is 7 a.m. So somewhere in between, there's a half hour in there that we lost. Uh, so there's somewhere else where it's on the half hour. Uh, I'm, I'm going to get that down. Uh, but we've got a question. Yes. This is from Kristen. Kristen says, I recently tried DIM with I3C and phosphatidylcholine for hormone balance, and after a few days, I couldn't sleep. I had horrible racing thoughts and not the normal to-dos, off-the-wall stuff. Made me feel like I was going crazy. What do you think? Well, I mean, I think the first step is really understanding whether she's got proper detox pathways for estrogen. That's okay. the first step. That's what okay. we've got to know. High five, bro. High five. High five. Yep. High five. <laughs> so, so if everyone heard what she just said, you can't just shotgun in something that a marketing team has put together that says helps with hormone balancing. And DIM is really good. I3C is really good to help balance hormones in terms of utilizing the hormones better and, and sending them down the right pathway. Right. But if, if there's so much confusion in your system, which happens because of all, you've heard me talk so often about toxic chemicals, exactly what Dr. Snyder just said, that these toxic chemicals, if they're in your body, they don't let circuits work properly. They throw things out of balance. And once again, we're back to what I've been saying a lot for this last year, and that is the amount of environmental toxins that we have Every newborn child had, has over 200 toxins in their bloodstream at birth that aren't supposed to be there. They came from mom. So that means mom's got all of those and mom doesn't know it because she's doing her best in, in her life, the best that she can, and doesn't realize about all these toxins. So uh, Dr. Snyder, what's a first step for somebody? Is the first step to look and see about toxins? The, one of the first steps is absolutely that, but also a first step is looking to see what's going on with the hormone system. So why are they putting you on a supplement that is clearing estrogen? Is, is estrogen dominance a concern? And very possibly it could be, but I would be curious to know, you know, what is the percentage of free estrogen versus, you know, the utilized estrogen? What's, you know, I would like to see what's happening within, within the different pathways to figure out if there's even a problem with the detox pathways for estrogen. That Excellent. those are just there's a lot of questions there. I feel that um, haven't been answered, and what, what you're, it's just clearly you're not getting the results you want, mainly because we just don't know what's going on here. And yes, it's absolutely important to be working on and seeing what's going on with the toxic load, and equally as important, you know, digging in and finding out. Like I just I don't even know what the symptoms are initially um, for, for why those, those supplements are recommended to begin with. Right, right. And it could have been some marketing because those yeah, things are- have, Absolutely. Those yes, and those will say marketing. hormone balance, but right. those are specifically focusing on only, we talked about what well, you'd mentioned, the baseball team, right? right? And how all of these different players, maybe estrogen isn't even the concern. Right, right, exactly. Uh, with with yar at not a uh, not wed <laughs> with yar at not dewey for, that's a first name with yar not dewey if I'm saying it properly says it's seven a.m. in Malaysia so thank you for that thank you we're we're gonna get the time right all over the world here that's really great that's really. to hear <laughs> so so I fully agree everyone uh, so let's talk about women's hormones first now yeah. there are three different types of estrogens yes. that our bodies make, men and women. And each of these types can go down three different pathways. Yep. And so one of the pathways is very cancer protective. 
Two of the pathways are more cancer encouraging. And depending on which of the hormones that's going down the undesirable pathway too much, you may be at risk here. So Dr. Snyder is exactly right that the first thing you want to do is look and see what kind of hormones is my body currently working with. One more thing I'll say, and then we'll let Dr. Snyder comment on that. For men, looking at total testosterone is helpful, but archaic. I'm going to give you the full picture. Yes, and there's right. no full picture there. Right. Looking at DHT, that stands for dihydrotestosterone, we learned in the 1990s was helpful to understand the picture a little bit more. But now we know there are different metabolites of DHT. There are two different metabolites. So guys, you want to look at total testosterone, DHT, and the two metabolites of DHT. And that comes from Meridian Valley Labs. That's the only lab I've ever seen that does that test. Yeah. Uh, but it, it it's tells not, you. It's not, it's not a frequently ordered test either, unfortunately. Unfortunately not. And that's from one of my original mentors, Dr. Jonathan Wright. Just a brilliant guy who um, wrote about this uh, about five years ago, I think. So Dr. Snyder, in terms of the three different types of estrogens, the three different pathways, what do you look for in the tests that you use? And do you use saliva, urine, or blood? I Personally, I'm a big fan of the Dutch test. So we're looking at urine metabolites um, because that will give, not only do we get to see metabolites, we get to see, we get to see what's free, especially when I'm, we talked about cortisol earlier. You know, it's one thing to know how much free cortisol we have, how quickly we're using it, right? Versus, you know, how much to total cortisol. Same thing, understanding those pathways, you know, there's, and that's what's so great about the Dutch test. It'll let you know whether you're in the danger zone or not. Hi I highly recommend that you have someone read the test for you because it does look like a different language when you're looking at that. But finding a qualified person, there's more and more people who are qualified to read, read Dutch tests than ever before because it's becoming one of the gold standard definitive tests, at least what we've got right now, to give us a bigger and greater picture. And then we can decide whether DIM is the right thing or maybe just adding more cruciferous vegetables is enough to get the job done. And so, Or recognizing that maybe it's not even estrogen that's the concern to begin with. Right, right. Uh... And, uh, you know, uh, my, our, our good friend, Tom Maltair, um, uh, I just recently saw a TED talk that he did and uh, uh, it was on cruciferous vegetables. That's broccoli and uh, cauliflower and bok choy. Yeah. And Brussels sprouts, you know, they're really so good to help everyone metabolize their estrogens and testosterone down the healthy pathways, the non-cancerous pathways, everyone, especially if there's a family history of hormone-related cancers, everyone should be eating some cruci cruciferous vegetable every day. I agree. And, and you just go to Google and you type in list of cruciferous vegetables and print it out and you'll see there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, yes. Not just the big boys that we're talking about, but there's a bunch of them. And even you make arugula, sure. even lettuce, not, arugula, spinach makes that list. Um, kale makes the list. And broccoli sprouts are one of the best ways um, to really help clear that and open up detox pathways for the liver. I mean, not just how we're supporting estrogen metabolism and, and hormone metabolism, but all, but just giving your liver some love. Goodness yeah. knows if there is any organ besides the brain who needs love, <laughs> it's gonna be the liver because the liver has got the dirtiest jobs. And Absolutely. it's not only just metabolizing our hormones, it's metabolizing our proteins and it's metabolizing our fats. I mean, uh, you know, how we're breaking everything down and dealing with toxins is, is through the liver. So I think Christopher's vegetables for the liver alone is something that we need to be doing every day. So everyone go, go to Google after we're done and just type in list of cruciferous vegetables so yeah. that you can print it out, put it on your refrigerator for a week or two so that you're reminded of the ones um, that you want to introduce to your family. Um, and you just include a little bit of that every day. It's going to always help protect you. And this thing about broccoli sprouts, we were talking about that. We started talking about that in my office uh, in 1981. Uh, I opened in 1980, and I remember the first the year. Broccoli sprouts exist in 81. No, I'm just kidding. They did. They they've been growing a long time, you know. But and uh, their sprouts are so easy to make; it's a no-brainer. 
And you know, the easiest way, you just get a, a cap that's got a screen on it and it's, you screw it onto a mason jar. So you get a mason jar and the cap, you put the seeds in there, you soak them for eight hours or so, and then you pour it out, turn it, turn it upside down and slide in a bowl, you know, so the mason jar is sitting at an angle and all the water runs out through the screen in the cap. And you just let them sit there and once a day, just rinse them off, pour some water and shake it up a little bit, pour it out and let it sit in the bowl like that. And in about three days, you can see sprouts are starting to come out of the seeds. And if you do it with your kids, it's really cool to see. A couple of days after that, now their sprouts are bigger and you put them in the window and you see they start to get more green to them. And the green is chlorophyll and also some of the anti-cancer ingredients in the broccoli sprouts. Mm -hmm. When the green starts coming in, you know that you're building more of that. And then at about seven days to nine days, you got sprouts. Throw them in your soup, throw them in your Ooh, salad. Salads, yeah. Really simple, really simple and easy, inexpensive to do. You just want organic broccoli sprout seeds. Which, and it's great that you're sharing too, because a lot of people can't just, not everyone's got a farmer's market in San Diego, California. And so, right. you know, I just go to the market, but it's nice because lots of places all over the world, you can at least get the sprouts and you can continue to, to grow them in your kitchen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carol writes, no question about stress and hormones. I get ocular migraines. That means in the eyes, in the if eye. I'm really stressed, which is associated with hormone imbalance. Carol, what that means is that your chain is about to break most of the time. And when you pull a little harder, when you have a really stressful time, if those symptoms come, it means that's an area that needs to be addressed, that it's a weak link in your chain. And as we age, any of our weak links can get a little weaker, right? So you really want to dial down maybe with a little more functional medicine principles, some of the concepts you're hearing here today as to how do I make that link stronger so that when I have stressful times in my life, I don't get these ocular uh, migraines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carol, honey, and you know, the, some of the easiest things you can do is just, you know, I would have a little essential oil blend of lavender, cedarwood, bergamot that you have on, on hand. And what I recommend, you know, I remember when I was feeling pretty stressed a lot and I couldn't have told you when I was kind of in that tipping point. If you would have asked me, I probably would have bit your head off and told you I wasn't stressed. And so, you know, and I know that's how a lot of people operate. I'm not the only one. And what I recommend is how this is where your phone comes in to play, not to scroll on Instagram, but to have it chime, like a little chime every 60 to 90 minutes where you take out this little blend. I do 10 drops of each in a 10 mil roller, lavender, cedarwood, bergamot, and you top it off the fraction of coconut oil. You roll it on your palms. You take some deep, deep belly breaths. Because again, where we're perceiving stress is in that limbic system. That's where I call it the stranger danger system. We, we talk about memory in the hippocampus. Amygdala is literally stranger danger. Your, your amygdala is literally looking for perceived stress. You know, that's its job in a lot of ways. And that's where we get very anxious. We get a lot of worry. We get a lot of overwhelm. Um, but simply breathing that in, we talked a lot about that on your episode on Facebook Live, is the that, that no holds bar pathway through the olfactory nerve straight to the limbic system. So breathing in those calming essential oils will reset the system and take you from sympathetic overdrive down to parasympathetic. And if you're consistent with it every day, because you've got that little chime, you should be able to have a tool that may circumvent from you getting those ocular migraines. Really good answer. A couple of things I want to comment on there that she said. One is that the nerves of smell the olfactory nerves go straight back to the memory center of the brain without any screening. And that's one reason why essential oils, there's a whole world to essential oils. And the pearl that Dr. Snyder just gave you is one of those, they really work. The second thing that I wanna comment on that she said was every 60 to 90 minutes, and many of you remember I've said before, the first, page in Dr. Pedram Shojai's book, of, uh, I, forget, I forget the name of his Good book, uh, is set your alarm for every 60 minutes. When the alarm goes off, if you do some oils like that, but also 
you consciously take five deep breaths and you're conscious about it. Take the deepest breath you can, feel your belly expand a little bit and breathe it out and do it again and breathe it out. And when you, every hour within one day, you notice that you're just calming down. And if you do that with the essential oils that Dr. Snyder is talking about, that's a really good one too that will help to keep us more calm. The third thing I've got to say is Sharon said, South Australia is actually 8.30. Sorry, wrote the wrong time. So that takes the stress off for me. Thank you so much, Sharon. That's really great. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, for clearing that up for us. Um, Marzi's laughing in the kitchen. <laughs> she is so. totally laughing, I bet. Um, and you're absolutely right, Dr. Tom. You always the deep belly breaths. That's why I have people put them on the palms. We want to leverage that chemistry. Um, and we want to be able to leverage taking those deep belly breaths and you know five breaths is a very small little mini meditation so when yes. you pair those together clearly the stress is probably the triggering piece like you said dr tom for those ocular migraines it's worth looking at and seeing what's going on with your hormones as well um just because but there's an interconnection there a lot of women especially when they're highly stressed do tend to trigger migraines especially before their period or during their period but there's a lot more going on and we're still getting a lot of clarity exactly what that mechanism is but stress does play a huge role there so that everyone knows, I'm going to talk more about this. Dr. Snyder has a new book out, The Essential Oil Hormone Solution. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I think I've got a couple of comments in that book. Uh, yes, and about yeah. The book. yeah. Yeah. So we'll tell you more about the book and how to get it. Uh, but um, I, I want to ask you, um, you've got an essential oil recipe for blood sugar cravings and also for overcoming fatigue. And you talked about the one for stress. So can we talk about the other two, blood sugar cravings Absolutely. and overcoming fatigue? Absolutely, so let's just share. You know, the great thing about the, the cravings blend is it's kind of a two for one. You know, I'm a big fan of two for one. You know, why not? Why not get more out of something than just the one thing? And one of the oils that I really love for blood sugar balance is going to be cinnamon. We know that cinnamon has been historically researched in lots of articles for its ability to help support um, regulated insulin levels. And so that's one of that's one of my favorite go-to oils. And guess what? The essential oil of cinnamon oil, it's 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 the same thing. We're just using it in oil form. And so one of the things that I mentioned earlier was how when we're feeling overly stressed and cortisol is either we've got too much of it or it's deregulated, we know that cortisol has a way of hijacking the willpower um, part of the brain, right? That sent that prefrontal cortex. That's where we that's where we're rationalizing, that's where we're making decisions. And when you're, it's amazing to me how profound hormones are in the body, especially a hormone like your like cortisol, which I consider to be a very universal survival hormone. And at the end of the day, I always tell people the number one job of us as human beings is to survive. That's number one. And then number two is to make babies. You know, you're an evolutionary success if you have grandbabies. That's technically, I, I believe that's a biological evolutionary success. But in order to have babies, you got to survive first. And so we have a lot of survival mechanisms built in. And if your body's in survival mode, it's going to want to continue to ensure that we are eating to survive. And so we hijack that prefrontal cortex. So I love this blend because I find that people, you know, people come to me every single day. I'm sure they do with you, Dr. Tom. And they tell me, like, I don't know how to get these cravings under control. And I was like, well, honestly, no, there's no, I understand. We know why you, you don't have a choice. You're, you're being hijacked by your own chemistry. And so I love using an, I love using an essential oil blend because I want people to win the stare down contest with the cupcake or the donut, you know, because it's that, that moment that, that, you know, a craving is a craving for a reason. And if you've got nothing to support or no type of trick or tool to get you out of that, that zone of cravings, you're in trouble. It's an average craving lasts about three minutes, give or take. And I'll tell you what, you can do a lot of damage in three minutes. You can eat a lot of Ben and Jerry's. You can eat a lot of Doritos corn chips. So the blend that I have, it's a 10 mil roller. Um, it is, it's gonna be 
10 drops of, so like a little 10 mil roller like this, Dr. Tom, like this, a 10 drops of peppermint and pepper, peppermint was discovered. There was a really a great article in the Journal of Neurology by Dr. Alan Hirsch. And they found that peppermint was a powerful cravings and appetite suppressant. So I always have peppermint in my cravings blends because it's phenomenal at just eradicating that craving. So 10 drops of peppermint, I do five drops of grapefruit because grapefruit is also phenomenal for, um, for cravings. It's also great for boosting energy, focus, happy neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, cinnamon for helping with the, with the blood sugar regulation because that's a big part of it too. Your body's thinking that it probably doesn't need and have enough sugar to function. Um, so it's five drops of cinnamon and then five drops of ginger. And then you just put those into this blend. You roll the blend over your palms and again, it's, it, the key is really having it with you at those times. So know your triggers. If you tend to have cravings in the middle of like 10 o'clock at night when you're watching Netflix, have it with you there. If it's in the middle of the day when you're at work and your best friend just brought in a bunch of Dunkin' Donuts, I don't know, then make sure that you have them you know, at the, um, at the office before you walk into the break room. So just again, having an oil like this, it's one thing to have it. It's another thing to actually use it. So if you do use it, you have bought yourself a good 30 to 60 seconds to walk away from whatever the thing is. If you're in Italy, gelato, right? You walk by your favorite gelato place. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Those are really good suggestions. Um, a, a couple of questions have come in yes. about detoxing and hormones. Uh, uh, Joey asks, what if endometriosis and a huge belly, how to rid toxins? Angie says, how to increase progesterone levels if they're low? So let's do the endometriosis and huge belly and the ge general concept about detoxing first. Yes, the absolutely. Most, yeah, go on. The most important thing about detoxing, in my opinion, the most important thing, you have to have the pathways open to get rid of the crud. Yep. That means you have to drink enough water. That's the first basic step. How much water? How many people? That's going to be the test. So for everyone out there, type in the answer, how much water are you supposed to drink a day? So I want to see if we get 10, 20, 50 answers here that are correct. So we won't give you the answer right now on that one. Let's see what people write. All right. So give me an answer. How much water do you think you have to drink a day? Now, the second part of that, Angie asked, how do you increase progesterone levels if they're low? And I'll, Dr. Snyder asked you to take that one. Absolutely. Well, do you want me to talk about endometriosis really quickly or progesterone? Sure, sure. sure. I want to talk a little bit about endometriosis, mainly because this is a big area of focus for you too, Dr. Tom. You know, a lot of new research is showing that endometriosis is an immune system dysfunction. It's because it's an autoimmune disease. And you know, doctors aren't recognizing this. I know we talked about this in my Facebook Live today, that from research all the way to when we start to see it in bedside, it's about 17 to 20 years and we have a while to go. Um, but what's really happening with the risk factors for endometriosis is gonna be no surprise, exposure to toxins such as pesticides and dioxins. Clearly your microbiome plays a big role here as well. Um, and we, we look specifically, I know there's a research article that shows that women with endometriosis have a high level of gram negative bacteria and the bacteria toxin LPS, which is, you would know this, lipopolysaccharide in their pelvis, which is shown to actively promote endometriosis. So it's just, you know, it's one of those things where we're starting to see the bigger picture in a lot of ways. So, you know, we talk a lot, I know you talk a lot about leaky gut and leaky brain, but we're also seeing some of these autoimmune diseases proliferate as endometriosis. So a big part of that is opening the detox pathways, making sure that your gut microbiome is working properly, but also, you know, we're talking about visceral belly fat, which we've, we've mentioned a little bit. I think that it's important to not only see what's going on with your hormones, looking at your thyroid, looking at your, your your entire reproductive hormones, but also shifting a lot of what you're eating. I don't know exactly what, um, what that person's eating at the moment, but I would be focusing on um, a, and well, sorry, and not only an antioxidant rich diet, but an, an anti-inflammatory rich, rich program. That's what I'd be focusing on. Marvelous, marvelous. Uh, uh, so here come some of the answers okay. from, from the uh, question. And, uh, 
the vast majority of answers make me feel proud because it's a half ounce of water per pound body weight. That's exactly right. That's the minimum. Some people wrote uh, more than 10 cups a day. Uh, others wrote 64 ounces. Uh, others wrote uh, minimum two liter, better three liter. It, it's determined by your body weight, a half ounce per pound body weight. And you count it out. If you weigh 150, that's 75 ounces of water a day. Well, that's a whole lot of water. I'll be peeing all day. Well, that's the idea. You are going to pee all day. That's the purpose of it. So um, all of those answers are good. They're in the right ballpark. But to be target specific for your body, half ounce of water per pound body weight. Uh, then there were some questions that came in about what you were talking about, uh, Dr. Marissa. Um, uh, let's see, where is it? Went? Can you use cloves in place of cinnamon? Sure. I mean, it's clove. Clove is a powerful antioxidant. We know it's really high, uh, one of the highest antioxidant herbs out there. Sure, you can use clove. Clove hasn't been shown necessarily to um, to decrease cravings. I think you could just, if you don't have cinnamon oil, it's not, I would replace it with either cassia or you can omit the cinnamon oil altogether if you don't have it. Well, um, I'm going to uh, disagree a little bit oh, and agree. Okay. I'll agree and disagree. Okay, um, sounds good. I, I agree with the alternatives. Uh, clove is, as far as I know, the very highest in yes. antioxidants of any food or beverage or anything. I was startled to learn that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's at the very top of the list. So cloves are great to use, but they don't turn the genes on that cinnamon turns on. Yes. So if you're wanting to go for blood sugar stability, cloves can be helpful in a indirect way, as far as I know, I'm not an expert in cloves, but they certainly can be beneficial as an anti-inflammatory and all of that, great to use. But cinnamon turns genes on specific to stabilizing blood sugar. That's why I put cinnamon in my coffee I, all, all the time. Um, oh, uh, if too. I'm ordering, yeah, 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 I just put it in there. And you know, yeah, I'm, what I mean is that if you wanted to just use it for cravings, you could omit the, the cinnamon. But if you wanted it for a blood sugar stabilization, you know, where I love clove, I love clove for oral hygiene. I love clove for gut parasites, gut, you know, gut dysbiosis. I love right. clove for that. Um, right. So clove is it's a powerful antiseptic. It's great for dealing with, um, with environmental threats, um, hidden, hidden infections, but not necessarily for blood sugar regulation. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Perfectly agreed. Uh, Jory writes, just started your book, The Autoimmune Fix. It's amazing. Thank you, Jory. That's really nice. I've listened to you a ton, but I love actually reading about your life story and how you explain everything. Thank you. Thank you. Manuela asks, can you say that in kilograms, please? Uh, let's see, 2.2 pounds to a kilogram. So a half ounce. No, I can't. I don't know. <laughs> Ask Google. Ask Google, Google will know. Google, Google will know. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone had asked how to increase progesterone. Yes. And, and it's that's not a simple, simple answer necessarily, as you can imagine. Um, there could be other hormones playing a role. Oftentimes that's the case. You know, we know that when your cortisol levels are high, we tend to steal them. We call that the pregnenolone steal. So it could be stress. Um, it could be estrogen dominance due to a high level of toxins in the body, you know, that ratio. So we could see a drop in progesterone there. So it's important to look at the hormones and see what other hormones are at play. It could even be thyroid. It could be Hajimoto's, you know, that could be having an impact on your on progesterone levels. Um, so if we are, we want to look at the whole picture and see what's going on. One, managing stress, no surprise there. Two, there are um, there are progesterone loving foods. You want to make sure that you're eating lots of green leafy vegetables, lots of healthy fats. Those are going to be super important because again, and good healthy cholesterol. So eggs, because we know that in order to synthesize pregnenolone, we need cholesterol for that. So making sure that you've got the building blocks in place. I don't typically recommend right out the gate a supplement like Chase Berry or Vitex because again, like we talked about with the DIM earlier, it, it may not be solving the problem. 
So it's important that although there are some supplements that can help boost progesterone like Chaseberry, I like to know what's going on first before I just recommend Chaseberry willy nilly. Um, green tea extract has been helped. I love matcha for helping to support progesterone. Rhodiola is another great herb. Again, it's specifically indirectly reducing stress levels. Um, and then looking at, um, looking at nutrient deficiencies, zinc, um, you know, activated B vitamins, magnesium, all of these are super important to look at as well. So I know I wish I had a one, just a one quick swoop answer for boosting progesterone levels, but it's, it's never that simple. So yeah, I was just going to say that. Come on, come on. There's got to be one thing. Come on. You know, and I know that's what, so what they're it thinking. Is, Tom, it's vitamin B6. That's what <laughs> it is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so um, uh, to everyone that has that uh, inquiry and that concern, if it takes you six months to increase your progesterone levels, now think about it for a minute, your progesterone levels are low. What does that mean? It means that the tissue that makes progesterone isn't working adequately. Yes. What does that mean? It means it's probably shriveled, that tissue. For example, we know that young men, healthy young men that die of trauma, their adrenal glands, the glands that fight the stress of life, are the size of a walnut. Healthy young men, I'm, I'm sorry, young men who are not healthy and die of disease, same age, their adrenal glands are the size of a peanut. So that's, the, that's how the whole world of stress associated with health came about, was Dr. Hans Selye from Sweden in the 1950s. And the term stress comes from the point in metal making, metallurgy. When there's a little bit of torque to the metal, that point's gonna break. That's where the word stress first came from. And we associate it with health now because you get to that point to where you're breaking. You yeah. get to that point to where your glands can't do what they're supposed to do anymore. How do you rebuild adrenal glands in this example that have worn down, shriveled down to the size of a peanut. One cell at a time, one cell at a time. So what does that mean? It means the environment around that cell. Mrs. Patient, you have an entire new body every seven years. Every cell regenerates, some really quick, some really slow, but every cell regenerates. So how come I'm not regenerating a healthier cell? Because the environment around the cell is not supportive to make a healthier cell. So you have to change the environment. And what does that mean? Get the toxins out of there, eat the right kind of foods, the broccoli sprouts, using essential oils, all those base hits that win the ball game. And in six months, you, your progesterone is luscious. Progesterone is one of your luscious hormones. It is, right? and it's, it's very scarce. You have to ovulate. You have to ovulate in order to create progesterone because the purpose of progesterone is to maintain that pregnancy. And once we ovulate on day 14, 13, 15, however you're on. So I think it's really important if you're looking at progesterone levels, you know, this is one of the things I would recommend, you know, all women do, especially in childbearing age, even into early um, perimenopause is to track your cycle, to really know your cycle inside and out, because you'll get a sense of things. You'll, you'll understand what's happening with your cycle. Um, you'll, you'll know if you're ovulating or not. And so that's one of my, my, my biggest recommendations. I know we've, we've, we, we kind of consider it to be this mystery, um, but it's important for our overall health. I have a dear friend of mine who wrote a book who calls our menstrual cycle the fifth vital sign for women. It really is a key indicator to what's going on with the rest of our body. A lot of women don't know that you only make progesterone once you ovulate. So it's important to be looking at luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormones as well, just to kind of get a sense of what's going on there. Good points, really good points. Manuela asks, please give us the fatigue blend. Oh, yes. Please. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes, please. Hook a sister up with the fatigue blend. Um, it's a blend I love. I don't just use it for fatigue. You know, I know we, Dr. Tom talks a lot about brain fog and it being an indicator, really, for inflammation in the brain. I um, mean, mind you, there's a lot that we can be doing. I just, you know, I happen to have Dr. Tom's book right here because I was interviewing him today. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are struggling with fatigue in the middle of the day, in the evening. We got to be looking at what's going on with the brain, what's going on with ourselves. But in the meantime, in between time, I have an amazing 
Jean blend. Um, it's in another roller because these are so compact and easy to travel. This will not only boost um, resp basically bring more blood to the brain. This will boost serotonin, boost dopamine. It will give you more energy and it, it just smells phenomenal. So it's got all those that those kind of the benefits that we want when it comes to leveraging an essential oil blend. So I do again, peppermint is a big player here. So I do 10 drops of peppermint. Um, I do five drops of wild orange, five drops of rosemary because rosemary boosts um, boost active memory by 70% by breathing it in. So I love rosemary for that. Um, five drops of frankincense because frankincense helps with neural pathways and making sure that things are connecting. Frankincense is also a powerful anti-inflammatory in case, you know, it's helping to support brain function. And then I also love three drops of basil because basil, like um, rosemary has that cognitive alertness, focus, and concentration function. And um, I just top it off with fractionated coconut oil or Jehovah oil, roll it over your palms or back of the neck, behind the ears, at the temples, and literally within 30 seconds to a minute, it kicks on and you feel like you're in your zone of genius. So again, it's not it's not the full fix. It's just enough to keep you going in a very natural way. It's better than drinking Red Bulls. It's better than eating candy. It's, you know, it's a very non-toxic, healthy way to get that energy back up and running. But it's also important to be working on that on an integrative level. Marvelous, marvelous. Uh, uh, let's see, there was a question. I'm allergic to cedar wood. Do I need to avoid cedar oil? It's, you know, it's always a good idea. Yeah, no, see, see the thing is a cedar wood oil is literally cedar wood. So yeah, I yeah. would, I would avoid it. And yeah. instead you could use frankincense, sandalwood, vetiver, marjoram, any of those wood oils. Wood essential oils are very grounding. That's why I love cedar wood so much. Cedar wood and lavender are my go-tos for sleep and shutting off that mental chatter. Um, but you could always sub out cedar wood for vetiver, frankincense, sandalwood, some of those other, myrrh is a great one as well. This is a great question from Carmelina. She says, how long does it take to regenerate the adrenals? I eat an autoimmune protocol. I've eliminated all chemicals. I do have Hashimoto's thyroid disease and take NDT, but I'm still exhausted. Now, this is a great question because almost everyone on this Facebook Live is an experienced consumer for health. You've all been work, almost all of you, I, I suspect, have been working on your health to one degree or another. And yet here's a case of someone who's working really hard, but still feeling exhausted. So Carmelina, the way you think about this is, you ever back out of your driveway and you say, what's wrong with this car? It's barely going backwards. What's, oh, the emergency brake. And you let the emergency brake go and then you can back up really easily, right? There's an emergency break that's holding you back because it sounds like you're doing all the things right that you've learned you've learned to do. So the question is, what's the emergency break? And that's where you need a really good practitioner to help you explore. Uh, uh, as most of you know, uh, my team uh, at the doctor.com is well trained for this. That's our goal is to find out what's the emergency breaks that are holding your health back. That's exactly what we do. Uh, but there are many good docs out there. You can go to functionalmedicine.org and look for a functional medicine practitioner who's gone through the certification program. Or you can ask a friend if they've got a doc that is an investigative doc that's working with you. Uh, Dr. Snyder, what town are you in? I am in La Jolla, California. So San Diego, mm -hmm. California. Yeah. There you go. There you go. So for those in Southern California, Dr. Snyder's not that far away. Uh, but you need some help here, girl. You're yeah. doing everything right and you can't do it on your own. So you need to find someone uh, um, who knows this world really well. Uh, yeah, it because could be, It could be a hidden infection that you don't know about. It could be mitochondrial dysfunction that may be going on. Maybe we haven't cued exactly into the right protocol for the Hajimoto's. I mean, those are just the first things that pop into my mind. Good points. Yeah. Uh, Joanne says, how do you clear out your methylation pathways, especially if you have the MTHFR gene? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the MTHFR gene, I've been talking about this a lot lately, 
The MTHFR gene, um, and for those that don't know, it's a common gene that most doctors look for now that indicates if somebody has a vulnerability in not detoxing very well in a very important detox pathway called methylation. There are but this is the uh, methylation. And so many doctors now test for the gene. And if they have the gene, a patient has a gene, they automatically put them on some protocol. And what I'm teaching now is that that is a limited approach, that having the gene doesn't mean you have the problem. It means you're vulnerable to the problem. Just like, you know, um, um, I was in San Diego last week and a keynote speaker at a medical conference where an oncologist uh, came on uh, after my presentation and she was talking about the silliness of doing mastectomies if you have a BRCA gene. And that's the most common gene uh, associated with breast cancer and you know, world famous Angeline Jolet found out she had that gene, so she had a double mastectomy to prevent a problem. But what, she, what the oncologist showed in the presentation, there are 10 different types of cancer that you get or you're vulnerable to with the BRCA gene, not just breast, uterus, bladder, uh, ovaries, uh, uh, and I don't remember the rest. That and so cervical she said, was there too. I'm sorry? I thought cervical was there too. So, probably is, probably is. So are you gonna take out the kidneys and the uterus and the ovaries and the bladder? And you, know, you, you, you can't do that. So just having the gene doesn't mean you take action. Having the gene means you check to see is that gene expressing itself. And so with the MTHFR gene, there's really simple tests called organic acids that looks for something called forminoglutamic acid or FIGLU, F-I-G-L-U. It's like a $150 urine test, it's inexpensive, that will tell you if you've got high FIGLU, you've got a problem with your MTHFR pathways. But if your FIGLU is normal, there's no evidence that that gene's expressing itself. Relax, just check it about every year or two to make sure you're still not having any indicators of the activation of that gene. So that's the first thing I wanna say about the MTHFR gene. Uh, you don't clear out the methylation pathways uh, uh, unless there is a need to. You don't address the methylation pathways, Joanne, unless there's a need to. If there's a need, then you dial it down. And we use the uh, FIGLU test, if it comes back positive, as the biomarker. It only takes two weeks, two or three weeks, to get it normal. Um, and so once you get the right approach, don't worry about it. And you just check the fig loop maybe every six months or so to make sure that your lifestyle is not contributing to that coming back again. Dr. Snyder, anything you'd want to add to that about MTHFR? I think that, I mean, very much, very important. We don't always activate these genes. That's, I mean, the goal is to not activate those genes, right? right. Um, right. But I think also it's, we talked a lot about this integrative approach. I think it's important that we're living a lifestyle that doesn't activate the genes in the first place. So making sure that you are, you know, one of my rules is a pound of green leafy vegetables a day. You know, a lot of, you know, that's going to not only help move things along in the gut, but it's going to help support the liver. It's going to keep those pathways open. So just, you know, focusing on what's on your fork, making sure that you're getting, you talked about, you know what, it's, it's all about those broccoli sprouts is really what it comes down to in this whole episode. So making sure that you're eating, you know, the foods that are going to help to keep you healthy and keep inflammation down. I find yeah. that that's really why, that's how we activate, um, activate that gene is when we're getting more inflamed. Yeah. And Joanne responded and said, my gene is, is, it is expressing. So how do I deal with it? You have to find out why it's expressing. And as Dr. Snyder just said, the first thing I'd look at is the level of toxicity in the body. There's panels of tests to look for antibodies to different chemicals, food sensitivities. Most common one is a sensitivity to wheat. Gluten can trigger the expression of the MTHFR genes and you, because you can't absorb folic acid, you don't absorb your B vitamins. And so the MTH, MTHFR will express itself. If you have inflammation in your gut, 
The most common place for the inflammation is the first part of the small intestine. Anything that comes out of the stomach that's a threat activates the immune system to protect you. And it's right there. And where do you think the B vitamins are absorbed? In the proximal part of the small intestine. Yep. So if you've got inflammation there for any reason, They're then what you're going to get is malabsorption of the folic acid, the folates, and the vegetables. You know, you're just not going to get it in because you're too inflamed. So we, you need a bigger picture view to see where it's coming from. Okay, on that one. What else do we have here? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Peter asked, does sunlight or earthing help with hormone balance? Absolutely. I mean, it's, and there's definitely research that shows that. I mean, you think about grounding your body and well, sunlight clearly vitamin D is a hormone in the body. A lot of people don't know that. Um, but yeah, I mean, any way that you can ground the body, you're reducing stress levels. I think that, I think it's always a good practice to be in nature as much as possible. Agreed. You know, it's, inc- it's remarkable how fast this goes, uh, uh, but I just got the hook. I just oh yeah, got- we, we probably gotta get, <laughs> we got the, we gotta go. <laughs> it's 2.02 a.m. here in Italy, and it's like. <laughs> <laughs> Time so, <for> bed. <laughs> so, so everyone, uh, we've got Dr. Snyder's link here for you uh, for her new book, The Essential Oil Hormone Solution. Uh, yeah, there you go, <laughs> there you go. Listen, when people like Dr. Snyder and I, you know, we spend months and months and years writing these books. Spend 20 bucks. If you 17. hear- 17, I mean, it's not even so, 20 yeah, bucks. So, so <laughs> if you hear from someone like me, that if I'm bringing her on, you can feel safe that this is high quality information, right? Uh, I mean, I'm not getting anything from this except the joy of knowing passing on great information to you. So spend the 17 to 20 bucks and with the shipping, 25 bucks. Let's just support this woman and let the publishers know, wow, look at all the people that are buying the book. And then write comments about it. Do do reviews on Amazon for the book. Those, Those reviews go a long way in terms of the book. And please do them for my books also. But just take take the 10 minutes, you know, to write a review if you find this book's really of great value. If so, boy, I learned two new things here that helped me or helped my daughter with dot, 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 whatever it should be. Okay. Uh, Dr. Snyder, thank you so much for joining. Really a pleasure to do this with you. We just zoomed through that one really quick. Yes, we did. It was, I told everyone we were going to entertain them today. So that's what we did. Right, right. right. All right, everyone, thank you so very much, and we'll see you next week, same time, same place. Bye-bye. And we have to keep this frozen smile until the staff turns <laughs> off the Facebook. <laughs> well, I, I, I know how late it is there. I was just there not too, too many days ago, so thank you so right. much.